So Dan Reed has said, can you talk about the Spanish Blue Division? The Spanish were quite good at straddling the fence between England and Germany. Okay, so I've not actually done a video on Spain before. I don't think I've even mentioned Spain before. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is talk uh, overall about Spain uh, in World War II, Spanish Civil War, World War II, give the overall situation, talk about what would have happened maybe if they had entered the war, why they didn't enter the war, uh, and what was the Blue Division about. I'm not going to sit down and, and say, hey, this is where the Blue Division was deployed, and you know here's the tactics they use. I'm not going to do that because I... To be fair, I'd have to do more research on that, but uh, I can talk about why it was set up, why it was sent to the Eastern Front, so on. So I will talk about it, but I'm going to do more of a... I'm going to basically be answering your second sentence more than your first, but uh, I will talk about the Blue Division as well. So the main source that I'm going to... Well, I'm going to encourage you to read this one if you're interested in Spain, because I think Mr. Stanley Payne does a very good job of this. Uh, Stanley Payne's Franco and Hitler. There are a couple of other sources that I have which do mention this, but uh, I think that one goes into an, a lot of detail, and I do, I do agree with mostly what he says, um, with a few minor exceptions. So I would encourage you to read that if you haven't done so already. Okay, so here's a not so accurate map. I know people are going to complain about it. Don't complain. Uh, Spain is the bottom left yellow thing, just in case anyone doesn't know where Spain is. Spain is there. Let's wind the clock back a little bit. Let's go back to like 1935, 36. Uh, what you have in Spain is one of the largest anarcho-syndicalist movements in Europe. Syndicalism being trade unions, anarcho-syndicalists are basically socialist trade unionists who want socialism, but it's kind of complicated. The point is that they've got a large socialist anarcho-syndicalist faction. Um, and they've also got other socialist parties and factions. They've also got communist, uh, several communist factions in Spain. And it's basically a hotbed of revolution. Now, the revolution fails in Spain. Uh, they try and take over the country or the strikes and whatever else, it fails. So what they do is they decide, well, it's failed. You know, we can't make this coup happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to get elected democratically. And so the socialists, uh, the alliance, the popular front gets elected in 1936. Bear in mind, you know, Hitler does the same thing. He gets elected, right? His coup fails in 1923. Well, this the same thing happens in Spain, except for this time it's the socialists. Um, and they get democratically elected. So this is, the, this is probably, you know, Hitler's is probably the first democratically elected revolution. But the Spaniard um, socialists then get elected as well. So this is probably the second time this has happened. Once they are elected, they start going on strike. There's there's mass strikes going on. They start seizing property, uh, both you know factories, farms. Uh, they start seizing church lands. There's murder. There's kidnapping. There's rioting. Spain is basically becoming uh, anarchic. Let's put it that way. And at first, this is kind of. Not tolerated, I think that's probably the wrong wrong word, but nobody really wants to do anything because they think, well, maybe things will die down, um, but they don't. And then it comes to a point where Franco himself says, well, it's probably best if we do something now, because if we don't, it will be worse if we, if we don't, basically. So they decide, okay, we're going to have to rebel. So a faction of the army, the Spanish army, decides that, it's probably better to start a war than it would be to carry on living under socialism. So they they, they rebel, and uh, the Spanish Civil War starts in 1936. Now, it's often painted, so uh, the Republican side is often said, well, we've got various socialist factions, various communist factions, uh, and anarcho-syndicalists, and then it's often said, okay, the nationalist side are the... Uh, nationalists, the fascists, 
and the capitalists, right? And that's how it's often painted. This isn't a true reflection of actually what happened. It's a bit more complicated than that. Yes, on the Republican side, you have various socialist factions. You have the communists. You have uh, the anarcho-syndicalists. And you have the Soviets, the Russians. They come over and they support the Republican side because they're trying to spread international uh, socialism, Marxism. And the Spaniards, especially once Franco gets into power properly, they blame the Soviets for, for this revolution. I don't know if that's true or not, um, but that's the perception that the Spanish Civil War was started by the Soviets trying to spread international socialism, Marxism. And so it's their fault. But whether that's true or not is irrelevant. And what is relevant is this nationalist side, which is, again, they say, well, it's the fascists and the Nazis and the, and the, and the nationalists. And Well, actually, no, it's not. It's not the capitalists. In actuality, the nationalist side is, yes, nationalists, yes, fascists, but also socialists and anarcho-syndicalists, which are socialists. And what people tend to forget is that fascism is actually a form of anarcho-syndicalism. That's where it comes from. Franco says this himself. Um, Italian, sorry, Spanish... Uh, Fascism comes from anarcho-syndicalism. And indeed, fascism in Italy was the same thing. It came from anarcho-syndicalism. Uh, Mussolini says he was a anarchist and he was a socialist prior to the First World War. So it, it's very similar roots. You know, people like things when it's simple. Oh yeah, it was the it was the fascist versus the and the capitalist versus the the communist. It's like, no, that's not it's more complicated than that. This is a civil war. And you have, you know, various elements on both sides who are fighting, you know, it's brother versus brother. You, you know, it's like, if you think of the English Civil War, it's like, oh, it's the English versus the... No, it's, it's English versus English. It's brother versus brother. And that's exactly what was happening in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, and so it's not as it's not quite as clear cut as the Republicans are socialists and the nationalists are capitalists or whatever. No, it's not like that at all. And the fascists are, as I say, a form of socialism. And I've said this before. Um, so, yeah, we've got to, got to bear that in mind. And what ends up happening is that uh, Mussolini and Hitler, who don't want Marxism to be put in Spain, they decide to help Franco out and they side with the nationalists. And this is then used, oh, well, see, the fascists and the Nazis are all com uh, capitalists and they fought against the communists, so they're clearly not Marxist, socialists and all this other stuff. Well, that's, that's a misunderstanding. So let me take you to the political spectrum and we can talk about it. So this is the fascist and the national socialist third way. This is how they perceive the world. This is not me talking. This is them talking. This is how they perceive the world. So on the right, on the, on the political right, they see it as all capitalism. Um, and for the National Socialists, they see that as being Jewish. They, Hitler says it is international Jewish finance, capitalism. And he's against capitalism. Then you've got the left, the Marxists. This is Marxist socialism, socialism or communism. These things are... Prior to Lenin and Stalin, communism and socialism, the two words meant the same thing. They have now varied, I know, but at the time, they basically were synonyms of each other. They meant the same thing. And so the, the fascists and the Nazis see, oh yeah, yeah, Marxism is on the left. We don't want that. We don't want capitalism on the right. So we are in the middle. This is the fasc what's known as the fascist third way. And for Hitler, not Mussolini and not Franco, but for Hitler, he sees that the left is also Jewish. <laughs> so the left is Jewish and the right are, is Jewish. And I've mentioned this before, basically, capitalism is meant to be a Jewish thing. Uh, and let me get this right. So the Jews want to bring in capitalism to then this will then instigate a class conflict, which will then be exploited by the Jews, who also invented Marxism, supposedly. And then this will bring in a world revolution, and this will allow the Jews to dominate the world. 
and it's a big giant Jewish conspiracy. It's all to do with the racial theory of history, blah, 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 blah. I don't need to get into it. But the point is that the fascists are in the middle, the Nazis are in the middle to prevent either a capitalist or Marxist revolution and or uh, to stop the Jews, <laughs> right? It's this Jewish conspiracy. That's the reason why. So that's the reason why Hitler, for example, is not a Marxist socialist, nor is he a capitalist. He is actually what he thinks is in the middle. He thinks he's a socialist, national socialist though, not international socialist. And he's against the Jews, which are Marxists and capitalists. Well, um, Mussolini is the same sort of thing. He doesn't like uh, Marxist socialism, which he used to be part of. He used to be a Marxist socialist, which means he doesn't like capitalism as well. So he hates capitalism. He's, he's, he's no longer a Marxist socialist because he got kicked out of the Socialist Party. So he creates his anarcho-syndicalist movement, um, the fascist movement, that's what it is. And it goes a third way, partly between capitalism and socialism, supposedly. Well, Franco does the same sort of thing. Prior to the Civil War, Franco isn't really pol political, but... I'm not sure when, to be honest. I have to. I haven't looked into it too in depthly, but he sides with the fascists in Spain, and although not entirely, I'll come back to that. And his is a version of fascism, which is supposedly in the middle as well. So, if I was to uh, explain the Spanish Civil War by looking at this chart, this political spectrum, which is the fascist third way, it's the fascists in the center versus the international Marxists on the left. That's how it is. So it's it's both, it's two versions of socialism. It's just national socialism versus, with a small n, versus international socialism. That's the Spanish Civil War. So the Spanish Civil War goes on for a couple of years and it ends with a, uh, a Republican defeat. So Stalin pulls out, he Stalin decides that it's better if there's going to be an international revolution, that he wants to be in control of it. So he pulls out of the Spanish Civil War. Uh, the, the nationalists conquer the, the remaining Republican areas, and it's victory for, the, for Franco. Now, at the end of the Civil War, Franco is in debt to Hitler and National Socialism and Germany. He, he owes them money. He's in debt to them. He's in debt to Mussolini for helping him out and the fascists there in Italy. And so he's he is definitely, you know, he's he's a uh, he's a fascist who's in debt to these two ideologies. And he also is aligned with the fascist third way. He's aligned with them. So he's in debt. And this is bad because the Spanish economy is in ruins not only have they been at war for a while it was a civil war they you know the lands prior to the civil war were seized by the socialists and the communists and the anarcho syndicalists and blah 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 so the, the the country is ruined in that sense they then had a civil war that fought over it so yeah their their economy is in dire straits so franco starts to implement policies that he thinks will solve the issue one of them being autarky, which is self-sufficiency. He doesn't want to trade. Uh, he wants to be self-sufficient. He wants to, everything to be grown in Spain. Why? Because again, just like Mussolini, just like Hitler, they believe that trade is bad. This is mercantilism. It, it, like, trade is bad, and uh, they want to be self-sufficient. They don't want to rely on their enemies. Um, they don't want to be international. They want to be national. So it, it kind of goes into that. Everything should be produced in Spain as best as possible uh, and not be reliant on their enemies. What helps is corporatism. Uh, so anarcho-syndicalism, syndicalism being trade unionism, I mentioned this before, uh, trade unions which are big enough to in embody the nation, body, corpse, corporation, that's where it comes from. So Spain becomes a corporate system, although not as much as it was, I don't think, as in Italy and Germany. But... To some extent, they were corporatist. And so the corporations, giant trade unions, that unite both the workers and their employers, uh, they unite the nation, or meant to, and solve the uh, crisis going on in uh, Spain, supposedly. 
But none of this helps, because what ends up happening is by the time World War II comes along, uh, by 1940 and then onwards into 1942, you actually have a famine going on in Spain. So corporatism and autarky don't work. Uh, they also didn't work. It also doesn't work in Italy. It also doesn't work in Germany. But yeah, uh, autarky doesn't work. Corporatism doesn't work. It's inefficient. Who would have guessed? And so by 1940, the Spanish economy is so dire that there is actually threats and actually becomes a famine in parts of Spain. And so Franco, during the war, um, we'll get to this properly, has to abandon autarky. Um, partly. So we will see. We'll come back to that. Okay, so Germany goes to war, uh, invades Poland, Britain and France declare war on Germany in retaliation. So at this point, Franco is in debt to Germany and Italy, and Franco is aligned ideologically, ideologically uh, with Germany and Italy. So when they go to war, Franco feels like, yes, we should go to war. So he is eager to go to war. Now, it has been said, and, in the, and the myth developed after the war, or towards the end of the war, that Franco didn't want to go to war, that he was just playing Hitler, and there's this giant conspiracy rumor thing where he wasn't really interested in joining the war, and he successfully managed to keep Spain out of the war. No, that's a load of rubbish. At the time, Franco wanted to go to war. It's only because Germany and Italy lose the war or are losing the war that Franco you know, turns around and tries to play it out as if he'd never wanted to go to war in the first place. But the reality is, if you look at the sources and if you read the accounts, no, it's pretty clear Franco wanted to go to war. He was very eager to go to war, in fact. Um, but there was issues, and the reason why he didn't, well, there's are. There's multiple reasons, we're going to get into that in a second. Now, the Spanish army is roughly 200, 250,000 strong, but it mobilizes and gets to about a million men ish. Um, they do have four tank regiments, but they don't have enough, well, they don't have any replacements, they don't have um, enough trucks. Uh, so, their motorized units, they have four tank regiments and a few other motorized infantry units, but they don't have enough trucks to fully make them motorized, so that's not good. Um, they do have an, a navy and an air force, but again, not super prepared to go to war. And uh, basically, if they, they, dis they realized that if they were going to go to war, then they needed German assistance. They needed arms, they needed food, because they're in the middle of a famine, and they would need air support, and desperately, they would also need oil. And it wor they worked it out that Spain would only be able to fight for a handful of days before they ran out of, of oil, fuel, um, you know, ammunition, etc. They only had, uh, I think it was literally days, but it might have been a couple of months. They only had a couple of months before Spain wouldn't be able to go on the offense. Like Spain would, Spain's offensive would, would wear out. And so they needed German support in order for them to go to war. And this is one of the main reasons why they didn't go to war, because, well, Germany wasn't able... I mean, if you think about Germany in World War II, they're supplying the Italians, they're supplying the Hungarians, the Romanians, uh, you know, so on and so forth, the, the Finns. They're supplying a lot of people, they're supplying themselves. They don't have enough oil. I've covered this in many videos. They don't have enough oil. Um, and it's not like they had an abundance of ammunition and had tank guns and whatever else. So it's not like, oh yeah, we can just quickly supply Spain, it'll all be okay. No, they don't have enough. They can't do that. They can't support Spain. They don't have enough supplies to do it. And so this is one of the main reasons why Spain doesn't go to war is because Germany can't support them. So once the fall of France happens, well, actually during it, Franco is quite ego. He's like, hey, yeah, we'll go to war. Um... And we can go to war, we, you know, and he's saying, we can go to war, we can go to war. We just need some food, we just need some arms, or a lot of arms, and we need some air support, and we need some oil, but if you give us that, we'll go to war. Now, why did Franco want to go to war, apart from the fact that he was ideologically aligned to Germany? Why would, why would Franco want to go to war? Well, he had several aims. Um, one of them was to take Gibraltar, which is, uh, for those of you not in the know, 
Gibraltar is a little piece of territory at the bottom of Spain, or the bottom of the Iberian Peninsula, and it's owned by Britain, still is, um, and it's basically a small port uh, with a rock. It's known as the Rock, uh, and it's at the very gateway to the Mediterranean. So it allows Britain, it's like a stop into there. It allows Britain to blockade the Straits of Gibraltar. It allows them to go into the Mediterranean. You know, if it was part of Spain, it would be hard for Britain to go through that route. Uh, and so the Spaniards think it is theirs, and so they want to take it. And that's one of the aims to take Gibraltar. And if you look at this map of uh, Europe, you can see, well, okay, if they take Gibraltar, there's now no way for Britain to come into the uh, Western Mediterranean, which is bad, because if you think about, if you watch my videos on the North African campaign, you'll know Tiger, Con uh, Tiger Convoy uh, went from Britain through the Western Mediterranean to um, Egypt and Port Adam and supplied Orkinlek and, uh, uh, sorry, Wavell and then Orkinlek with supplies which were needed for the operations in North Africa. Lots of tanks went that way. So had uh, Britain lost Gibraltar either at this point or prior to it, they would have had to go right around Africa. That could have changed. I don't think Rommel or whatever could have taken Egypt, but I think it would have made the situation a lot worse in Egypt and North Africa had let's say, Tiger Convoy or the other convoys not gone through the Western Mediterranean. So Gibraltar would have been, a you know, uh, it would have been a dire situation had Britain lost Gibraltar in World War II. And Hitler is actually quite eager for Franco to take um, Gibraltar. He thinks this is a good aim and he he, under, he recognises the that, yeah, if Gibraltar goes, the, the Mediterranean is pretty much going to be a, an Italian lake at the very least. So Hitler wants this. Now, the problem is, is that the Germans don't think that the Spaniards can take um, Gibraltar on their own. So there's negotiations going on amongst the other war aims. There's negotiations going on as to whether the Germans can or should help the, uh, the Spaniards take Gibraltar. Um, I may as well talk about it in depth now. So... The Germans prepare several divisions, including, I believe, the Totenkopf division uh, to take Gibraltar. And they're actually in training after the fall of France. They're in training to uh, to take it. Um, there's some mountaineer units as well and engineers and artillery all training ready for this operation. Um, the Germans think that they should do it all themselves, maybe with a little bit of Spaniard support, but they want uh, to do it all themselves. The Span, the uh, Franco and the Spanish think, no, 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 we can do it ourselves. So there's an argument going on about that. Um, but it's not clear if the Spaniards would have had the opportunity to do it. it. It's kind of complicated. But yeah, there's a back and forth going on regarding Gibraltar. Another aim is Morocco. Uh, the Spanish have a little bit of territory in uh, northern Morocco, but they want the rest of Morocco. They also want a part. They also want parts of Algeria. This territory is controlled by Vichy France. It's one of their colonies. So, in order for Franco and Spain to take Morocco and/or parts of Algeria, uh, they would need to go to war with Vichy France, or at the very least, if they had taken that territory without a fight it would have annoyed, uh, to say the least, Vichy France. So if we look at this from Hitler's perspective, the whole reason Hitler's going to war is because he wants to go east. He wants to take uh, the Ukraine and the Caucasus. He wants to get the food of Ukraine and the oil in the Caucasus. And he wants Lebensraum, etc. And he talks about this in Mein Kampf and his second book. So he's going east, right? And so the last thing he wants is problems in the West. He doesn't want a second front in the West. Now, there is Sea Lion, you know, the invasion of Britain, but that falls through. Um, but at this time, he seems to, well, 
in my opinion, he's trying to get he's trying to make peace with Britain one way or another. He either he either wants to come to a peace treaty or he wants to try and bomb them into submission. Either way, he wants to solve the British situation and then go east. The last thing he wants is Vichy France kicking up a fuss in the West. So from Hitler's point of view, he you know, he he looks at Spain and the Vichy France situation and goes, well, I can either help Spain out with them taking Morocco and Algeria or parts of it, or I can keep the situation stable with Vichy France. Because obviously if Franco takes Morocco and Vichy France kicks up a force and starts to go to war against Spain, what's Hitler going to do, right? He, if he's, most of his armies are in the in the east, can he really spare the troops he needs to solve the situation in the west? No. So he wants to create a stable situation in the West while he goes East. And so this is actually a major reason as to why Franco doesn't go to war. Um, so Hitler says to Franco, look, after the war, we will give you Morocco and parts of Algeria. Because once we won against Britain and the Soviet Union, we will have British territories, um, you know, colonies elsewhere. So what we can do, you can have, you can take Morocco and parts of Algeria off Vichy France, and we will, in return, give Vichy France British colonies elsewhere as compensation, and that's probably more likely to keep the French happy um, rather than kick up a force and have a war going on in Western Europe, which we can possibly avoid. But Franco's not particularly happy with this arrangement because he feels like well, if, if Spain does not contribute to the war, there's no guarantee that Germany will reward Spain with these territories. So he's eager to go to war in order to guarantee that this arrangement happens. And this is part of the reason why they send the Blue Division to the east. Um, it's a way of kind of saying, yeah, yeah, we're not only repaying our war debts, but we're also showing, hey, yeah, we are on your side uh, and we are going east and helping you out in your conflicts because we want this territory that, you know, in in the south. So this is to guarantee that, yeah, we will receive this territory after the war. Now, it's not clear if the Spanish could actually take Morocco by themselves. In fact, Vichy France had a lot of troops in North Africa, and it does seem unlikely that the Spanish could have actually taken Morocco by themselves. And so uh, the Germans say, well, you know, if you do go to war, we'll give you a couple of extra German divisions there that will help you out. Um, and there's discussion going on with that. But it seems unlikely that they could actually take Morocco on them by themselves. They would have had to take Gibraltar first. It's a whole thing. So, yeah, it, it did seem unlikely, but it was on the cards, as was Portugal. Now, again, uh, would they have been able to take Portugal without German support? Again, that's up for debate. Although it does seem more likely because Portugal had a small army, only a, a few, well, uh, about 30,000 troops. Um, although they could have expanded that to th uh, 300,000. They had 300,000 reservists. But Portugal had a small army and Spain had a much bigger army. They had twice the size ready to go and they would have hit them pretty quickly. But there was negotiations going on with Portugal, uh, and it didn't end up becoming a thing. See, what ends up happening is uh, the Spanish start putting pressure on Portugal, and the Portuguese um, end up negotiating with, uh, with Spain and Britain, and they end up <laughs> playing each other off, and eventually uh, it get, they come to an agreement where okay, we won't attack you if you don't attack us, and we will mutually defend each other. So rather than Spain end up attacking Portugal, uh, the Portuguese successfully managed to negotiate the complete opposite of what the Span Spanish want. And so it was like, oh, okay, we've been stopped there. Although that didn't stop Franco from planning to invade uh, Portugal. And uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Payne goes on about that in his book. But as you can see, there are a few problems with this because, um, you know, if if Spain did go to war, one, they'd have to take Gibraltar, which they probably may have, you know, they, they may not have been able to do without German support, which the Germans weren't 
really able to help them. They certainly weren't able to help them after 1941, once Barbarossa goes on. But even in 1940, this would have been pretty problematic uh, for the Germans to help the Spanish take Gibraltar. Um, they may have, if Spain had gone to war with Britain, then the British may have taken the Canary Islands, which is just off of uh, Africa. And in fact, Churchill had, uh, I think it was a brigade, ready and waiting at any moment during the war to take the Canary Islands off Spain, um, because he because he knew it, this was like a sort of hey, if you go to war, this is what we're going to do, and so he had that brigade ready and waiting at any moment with a with a small task force to take the canary islands off spain so franco knew this was going to happen so he you know it was like uh oh um <laughs> so if they had taken gibraltar maybe the canary islands, islands might have been taken there's a possibility of the british landing in spain or portugal or north africa uh, you know there's a lot of things to you know, imagine, imagine if, okay, let's just imagine the best possible scenario. So the, Spain takes Gibraltar, Spain takes Morocco, Spain takes Algeria, and Vichy France, for some reason, doesn't go to war. And then Spain attacks Portugal, or maybe not, but let's just say it does. Okay, Canary Islands are going to be taken by Brit the British, because Royal Navy and this task force is ready to go. Um, now... Would Spain have been able to defend that huge conquered territory of Portugal and North Africa from both the British and then eventually the Americans as well? Probably not. Uh, it would have made the torch landings a bit more interesting, certainly. But would then Britain and, and America have gone through both Spain and Italy? You know, that's a kind of a big possibility. And... You know, okay, the Span Spanish had maybe a million men, and it, it was talked about whether they could raise two million men. Okay, but let's say they raise two million men. They've got no oil. They've got uh, very few arms and artillery, etc. They're, they're suffering in a famine. <laughs> and they've got this new conquered territory. Are they really in a position to stop Britain and or France from doing a lot of damage in North Africa and or in the Iberian Peninsula? Probably not. It's probably not a good idea. But if they had done it in, let's say, 1940, they certainly would have had the best chance. And there's an argument to be made that, okay, if they had attacks in 1940 before America gets involved, then maybe Britain would have gone, okay, we've had enough now, we're going to give up. But it's a great unknown, and we also know that, well... Churchill was like, we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them on the landing grounds, we'll never surrender. So is he really going to give up just because Spain attacks as well? Right? It, it, we don't know, but it seems unlikely. So the Spanish stay neutral, but it's not real neutrality. Um, they re start refueling German submarines. That's probably one of the biggest things they do. They, they refuel... Um, German submarines allowing them to operate further in the Atlantic. There's intelligence operations going on in Spain in favor of the Axis. Franco is very much in favor of the Axis. And bearing in mind, all what I've just mentioned now is being negotiated over and over and over in 1940, 1941, 1942. Franco, right up until, well, about 1943-44, he is very much of the opinion that the Axis are going to win. Yes, the war is... As the tide has changed in 43-44, but he still hopes that the Axis can win. It's only in, in 1944, with the Normandy landings, that he accepts that the Axis have lost. But up until that point, he's very hopeful of uh, the Axis winning and thinks that maybe if Spain joins in, there's a possibility. But yeah, all this is negotiating, but they refuel the submarines. There's intelligence operations going on in Spain in favour of the Axis. You have... Um, radar being installed in Spain again in favor of the Axis. Um, the Spanish uh, supply the Germans, and I'm not sure about the Italians, but they supply the Germans at least with tungsten, also known as Wolfram. Um, so this is uh, weapon, 
uh, materials, raw materials for weaponry, uh, for ballistics, etc., um, armor piercing and armor, is being supplied to the Germans. It's a major supply of tungsten and or wolfram. And then you also have the Blue Division. So when Germany goes to war with the Soviet Union, uh, the Spanish press, which is owned by the uh, the fascists, is basically like, yeah, we're fighting communism. And obviously Marxism was deemed, and the Russians were deemed to be those who started the civil war. They're the ones who are responsible. So there's a lot of fervor, you know, like, we're going to go east and take on the, the Soviets. And this was another period where it's like, Franco was like, should I declare war or not? And it was discussed again. But anyway, they end up sending the Blue Division. Now, because of all the hatred against the Russians and the Marxists, it was pretty easy. They actually had thousands of volunteers, uh, mainly in the um, the nationalist side, you know, the, the areas which were under nationalist control. They mainly rise up and go, yeah, we need to go east. Uh, so they set up the Blue Division. The reason it's called the Blue Division is because of the uniform that they wore. It was blue. Now, while it was made up by a lot of volunteers, um, two-thirds of the NCOs and pretty much all of their officers were regular army troops. Now, they might they might have been volunteers from other units, but yeah, it was, it was regular army. This was proper Spanish army. It was uh, three regiments of infantry with three battalions each, plus a reserve regiment. So yeah, quite a lot of guys. They march east. Um, they're supplied by the Germans, so they got German weaponry. So in some ways, it's kind of like the Croatian Legion, which I've mentioned before. They're supplied with German weapons and arms. Um, they are paid by the Germans, just like the Croatian Legion. And they end up in the uh, sort of Moscow-Leningrad area. Now, they on their journey to this area, uh, they realize, hey, wait a second. Um uh, you know, this Blitzkrieg, this amazing army that the Germans have supposedly got, isn't quite as amazing as we thought it was because we are on trains and we're not motorized and there's delays on the trains. And the reason why is because the Germans prioritize their own units rather than the Spanish, let's say. So it takes them ages to get there. Um, so that was a bit of a sort of, oh, wait a second, that's not quite so good. But once they get there, well, they, they actually make an impression. The German troops are very happy with the Spanish. Uh, the um, Hitler himself is very, very pleased with the Spanish, and other German leaders are as well. They fight on the front line. They, at no point in the war, do they break and flee. They stand their ground, which is what impresses Hitler. Uh, there is one battle where one of the regiments gets pummeled by. Um, the, the Soviets, and almost breaks, and another another regiment has to come in and save them. But apart from that, they actually stand their ground, and so they fight pretty well. So it, in a lot of ways, this isn't like, um, you know, this isn't like the Romanians were, you know, why, what are we doing on the Eastern Front? This isn't like the Italians, I guess, what the hell are they doing on the Eastern Front? And it's not like some of the other divisions were, they're not very well armed and whatever else. The Spanish seem to be pretty well armed. They seem to be like the Croatian Legion in a lot of ways. They have um, incentives to be there. They're volunteers. They hate the socialists and the Marxists and the communists. They hate the Russians. They hate the Soviet Union. And they're there to fight against all that. So they're ideologically driven. And they're motivated to save Europe from Marxist socialism. So I think because that motivation is there, they're able to fight on the front lines and do pretty well, and uh, as a result, they don't flee. Um, but eventually, as the war begins to change, as the domestic situation in Spain changes, uh, the Spanish Blue Division becomes a bit of a embarrassment to Franco, and so he ends up withdrawing it. And I'll talk about why in a minute properly. So in 1943, he withdraws it, some of the volunteers stay on. A couple of thousand stay on. They fight and fight and fight. Uh, and they fight all the way up until Berlin. In Berlin, there is still something like 250 Spanish soldiers fighting in Berlin 
in the in the ruins of the Battle of Berlin. So the Spanish fight right up until the end of the war for the Germans, but the majority of the division goes back home uh, where it's welcomed at first, and uh, yeah, but it's, it ends up being an embarrassment for Franco by the time he gets to like 1943-44. And why is that? Well, <clears throat> so prior to Pearl Harbor, uh, Franco is eager to join the Axis. It seems like you know the Germans are going to win, Moscow's going to fall, the Axis is going to be amazing, right? And so Franco, at this stage, wants to capitalize on Axis gains, and he wants to send this division east, and he wants to declare war and take Morocco, etc. But there's a couple of problems. Um, outside all the diplomatic things, there is the famine, which is in Spain. This forces Franco, because the Germans can't supply food to Spain. They haven't got enough food as it is. Um, so they can't really help the Spanish out. And so what ends up happening is Franco has to end up um, abandoning his autarky policy and he ends up trading with the West. He trades with Britain and he trades with America. He trades for food and he trades for oil. Um, I'll talk about the oil situation, but basically uh, the US partly embargo Spain, but do allow some oil to come in. And so because of this embargo, what ends up happening is the US send observers into Spain to make sure that the oil that they're sending to Spain does not get bought or given to the Germans. So they want to make sure that any oil goes in Spain, stays in Spain. Uh, the British also buy up raw materials in Spain. They, they spend a lot of money buying businesses, but also a lot of raw materials to prevent them from going into German hands. So especially as the war goes on, the trade between Spain and Germany becomes less and less. Although there is still trade going on, it, it's much less reduced um, just because Franco has to go west in order to get the food and the oil that he needs because germany can't help him um so it ends his autarky but it also hitler doesn't like frank well actually we'll come back to that but basically hitler starts thinking wait a second is franco really a part of the axis because he's he's trading with the west um and is he really a fascist right and there's a discussion going on in germany but also hitler himself is saying wait a second franco is not really a fascist and there's a debate going on about that. Let me let me uh, wind it back slightly. So Franco is a fascist. However, during the war, and even prior to the war, there is a faction in the fascist party in Spain which thinks that Franco isn't fascist enough. <laughs> right? So during World War II, there is a potential for a coup um, or, an, or a uh, rebellion by part of the fascist party to introduce more fascism in Spain, because they don't think Franco's gone far enough. The idea is that there will be a rebellion, uh, Franco will be ousted, and then they will be able to really bring in proper fascism. Um, that's the idea. Now, interestingly, as the war progresses, Hitler then changes his mind about Franco, and he starts to see Franco as being non-fascist and it's for the same reason as the fascists in spain aren't happy with franco either what hitler says is that franco has given himself to the church um spain's pretty you know if you think about the spanish civil war uh the the republicans are against the church you know they're seizing their property or well, franco is gets support by defending the church but after the war you know, Franco kind of doesn't really introduce proper socialism or whatever. He's leaving the Spanish church alone. Well, Hitler doesn't like this, so he's saying, you know, Franco is allowing the church to dominate. Is it, this is the reason why Hitler also criticizes Mussolini, because he's saying, you know, he calls uh, the the uh, Italian fascists the Vatican International <laughs> um, and says it's half fascist because even though Mussolini was a revolutionary, 
he made too many concessions to the church. Well, the same thing applies to Franco. He's saying, yes, Franco is basically in the pocket of the church, and it's wrong. He shouldn't be doing that. Um, and Hitler says that he wouldn't have uh, stopped the revolution in Spain. He wouldn't have um, supported Franco, and he would have allowed the Marxist revolution in Spain to continue if he had known what Franco was going to be like after the war, um, because Hitler actually is anti-clerical, he's anti-church, and he says that the revolution in Spain, if it had to continue, would have uh, eliminated the clergy and the clerics, and would have created a more red country, a more uh, socialist country. And so Hitler later on says he regrets supporting Franco, and he says he should have supported the other side. Because Hitler did not worry and didn't, you know, he had no uh, concerns if Sp uh, Spain had become socialist. He wasn't too concerned about that. What he feared was that Spain would become a satellite state of the Soviets and the Marxist socialists, which we know are, well, we, we don't know that, but Hitler thinks is Jewish. So Hitler's not bothered whether a country becomes socialist or not. He's not interested in that. It's just whether it's dominated by the Jews or not. And so uh, he actually says, actually, if I'd have known how the things would have played out, he would have allowed the Spanish Revolution to carry on. He wouldn't have supported Franco. And he would have allowed the revolution to happen in Spain because that would have destroyed the church in Spain. And that would have been better because that would have been a real revolution. Franco's revolution isn't a real revolution. And Franco has given himself to the church and he's not really a fascist and, uh, and so on. This is all talked about in uh, Zeitelman, Hitler, Politics of Seduction. And so when Franco sides with uh, not sides, but when he starts trading with the West for food and oil, Hitler is very suspicious at this point and says, what are you doing? You know, and Franco has to say, look, look, I'm only trading with the West because of economic reasons. We have a famine going on. We, we lack oil. I've got no choice. I'm going to have to trade with the West. You know, it's purely for that reason. It's not ideological. He's still an Axis member, you know, He's axis orientated, he's neutral, but he's on Hitler's side, and he's having to try and convince this. Franco is constantly worried about the domestic situation in Spain, and he thinks that he's going to get ousted from within. So that's why he has to give in and um, trade with the West, but then this alienates him from Hitler. But by the time this all plays out, it's too late anyway. It becomes obvious to most people in Spain that the war is lost for the Axis. Franco holds out a little bit longer. He really, you know, he sides ideologically with them, um, at least in principle. But then, you know, it's obvious by 1944 especially that it's doom and gloom for Germany. But throughout 1943, 44, 45, there's a fear that the West is going to oust Franco in Spain. So he pretty much has to not bow down, but he has to give in to more and more uh, demands and just accept the fate. You know, he's trying to avoid an invasion of Spain <laughs> because the last thing he wants is anybody ousting him. Uh, he successfully manages this. Um, but yeah, if you want more detail on that, go, in, go and read Stanley Payne's book. But uh, yeah, I think overall that's, that's a pretty good picture of Spain in World War II. But I want to hear your thoughts. Do you think if Spain had gone to war, would this have changed the course of the war? Uh, when was the best time for Spain to enter the war? And do you think they could have taken Portugal, Morocco, Gibraltar, with or without German support? And was... Franco, a real fascist. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye for now.